Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Matteson. In um, the next two years, we're going to have an election, there's going to be a new government, and politics in South Africa is going to change a lot, as it is in many other countries in the world, the US and Europe, uh, to name a few. Uh, it's going to be up to us to decide what those changes mean in South Africa, whether we have an ANC government or a coalition government of other parties. What will our new economic policies be? The old debates are dying, the new are still being born. My guest tonight is Professor Jeremy Seekings. Welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, Jeremy, you, you studied politics and, uh, uh, and sociology, and you're a professor of both of those at... Uh, the University of Cape Town. Uh, your latest book is Poverty, Politics, and Policy in South Africa. Why has poverty persisted after apartheid? And you address quite a few of these questions, and so it's really good to have you here. Um, before we get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of it, how many, are there many academics like you, and of course your, your co-author, Nicolina Trass, um, who are looking at poverty in South Africa and economic policy that could change that? There are. I mean, I think this is one of the fields in which South African universities, South African academia, is very rich in poverty studies. And the irony is, is that we, we live in a society where there's a lot of expertise about, about, about the nature of poverty, the causes of poverty, and uh, the possible solutions to poverty. And that expertise is, is not really uh, adequately mobilized in, in making remaking government policy. For many of us, that's very disappointing. We, this is not what we expected in, in post-apartheid South Africa. And that is both government and the political parties, I suppose. Uh, yes, that's, a, that's right. And of course, it's, it's very uneven. Some government departments are much more open-minded, much more interested in research. Others are much uh, 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 less interested in, in engaging with researchers. So when you hear President Zuma, as he did in his State of the Nation address, saying we now have an entirely new policy, it's called radical economic transformation, what goes through your mind? Well, I, I'm sceptical. I'm sceptical because we've had you know, quite a lot of announcements about how things are changing. And for the most part, over the last 20 years, uh, you know, the story has been about continuity rather than reform. Many of the policies which we have in place are policies which have uh, actually, if we're honest, we've inherited from the past and not really transformed at all. So I'm, I'm sceptical when, when politicians stand up and say we're going to do things completely different. Uh, let's see. Um, in a way, what you seem to be saying is that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, under apartheid, you had uh, social welfare for whites. Uh, the government came in, that system was in place, they added uh, uh, the majority of the country, blacks started to get some of those benefits, but the system didn't change. That's essentially the argument. Uh, I mean, there have been some important changes, and we look at them here in the book. Uh, so the first part of the book, uh, we're talking about poverty, uh, and nature of poverty, and trends, changes in levels of poverty, uh, and that's quite a familiar story, I think, that by a variety of indicators, poverty has been very persistent since the end of apartheid. There are more poor people now than there were under apartheid in absolute terms. The poverty rate, what's happened to that, depends a bit on definitions. It's probably dropped a little bit, but not by very much. But the middle part of the book then looks at, at policies. How have policies contributed to this? And in some ways, policies mitigate poverty very effectively. And, not, and the most obvious example of that is the welfare system that cash transfers, old age pensions, the disability grants, child support grants especially, they are very effective ways of getting cash into the hands of poor people and have a major effect on, 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 on the poor. And South Africa is a, globally a, really a world leader in this respect. There's, there's no other major country in the global south, period. Not even Brazil, which people talk about. There's no other country in the global south which redistributes from the rich to the poor as effectively as South Africa through the welfare system. But other policies really are undermining uh, the struggle against poverty. You, you have a quote uh, in your book, the, 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 uh, the rhetoric of pro-poor growth was never matched by the reality of pro-poor growth policies. That's right. So what we're essentially arguing in this book is that uh, pu public policies, government policies, have contributed to uh, the fact that it's really causing poverty in South Africa. And the fact that it's really causing it is unemployment. Right? We, we have very high poverty because we have 
probably by the best really measures, approximately 40% unemployment. I mean, 40% of working age South Africans who want work aren't working. I mean, it's an extraordinary statistic. The only other countries in the world with unemployment rates as high are countries that have been devastated by war, like Iraq. I mean, South Africa and its immediate neighbours, which are in a very similar position, are in the same category as Iraq after years of civil war and turbulence. It's an extraordinary thought. So we have this, we have high unemployment. Why do we have unemployment? We have high unemployment really because we have an economic growth path which has not been job creating. So we've had economic growth since the end of apartheid. Right now, it's quite lacklustre, it's very weak growth. But we have had growth, but that growth has not created jobs. Growth has not converted into adequate employment creation. You're not mm. saying growth isn't important, but growth. it depends on what kind of growth. Growth is very important. I mean, just to put that in perspective, uh, if we take all of the growth that has happened in South Africa since the end of apartheid, yes. 20 plus years ago, right, that growth would have solved the problem of poverty several times over if the benefits of growth had gone to the poor. Several times over. But the benefits of growth have not gone to the poor. The benefits of growth have generally gone to people who are not poor, including people like myself, university professors. University professors have a higher standard of living now than they had in 1994. Right? But uh, the poor uh, are, are, are pretty much in the same position. So growth is really important because when you have growth, you can, you can redistribute to the poor or hopefully it will benefit the, growth through, the poor through job creation. But... Our growth hasn't had resulted in job creation. Now, we're about to go to the break, so I need a, a, a very short answer to this question. I, I assume what you're saying is that uh, growth is a necessary condition to, to job creation, but not a sufficient condition. Exactly. Necessary, but not sufficient. Great. We'll take a break, and we'll be right back. We're back with Professor Jeremy Seekings. Uh, Jeremy, the other argument that people make is why things have gone wrong is neoliberalism. And as I understand it from your book, you think that's an oversimplification. That's right. Uh, we, we, we accept that uh, market-friendly parties, uh, mar sorry, market-friendly policies, policies have contributed to uh, uh, continuing poverty in, in some respects. But we, we, we are quite clear, you can't blame it all on neoliberalism, uh, for, really for two main reasons. Firstly, is that, you know, that there's a number of areas of government policy which are clearly not neoliberal. So the South African state, the South African government intervenes in markets quite extensively, most obviously through quite very extensive redistributions through welfare, through pensions and grants, we mentioned earlier. And black economic empowerment. And intervening, exactly, in, in, in business operations with requirements on employment equity and, and black economic empowerment. But also, uh, the, the state intervenes uh, uh, very widely in the labour market through the regulation of wages. And of course, that's come up now with the whole question of a national minimum wage. You know, this, is, this, is, this is very extensive intervention. Right. Uh, and in the book, we argue that some of these interventions are actually counterproductive in terms of poverty reduction. Now, just to take the neoliberal part of it, um, especially in the Mbeki era, uh, we adhered to World uh, Trade Organization rules to drop tariffs and so on, which appear to have had a very uh, uh, undermining consequence in areas like the textile industry and so on. Um, and we also um, um, allowed com companies like Anglo-American to leave and go abroad. Uh, some of that seems to have gone beyond what was really required of us. How, what's your take on that? I, I think you have to think about this sector by sector. Yes. In fact, you know, that, we, that we can't generalise across the economy as a whole. Right. So, for example, if we look at the mining sector, which we don't do in detail in the book, but if you look at research on, if you look at the mining sector, one thing that's very clear is, is that the platinum mining companies were given extraordinary latitude to export profits during the commodity boom, and there wasn't very much thinking put into how to use those wind, no, the, that, that period of boom in the interests of workers or the national interest. If I can interrupt you there before you go further, because that all happened under Tabo and Becky. 
Now that uh, uh, President Mbeki is out of office, he is focusing a great deal of his attention on exactly this problem of transfer pricing and other mechanisms, mechanisms that are used for South African and companies all over Africa to get their money out. Does that mean he realized he'd made a mistake or there was a loophole? Do you have any insight into that? I'd like to ask him. Uh, I think he, what, what, he's, what he's doing now is exactly right. Yes, you know, absolutely. For, for sectors like mining, we've really got to scrutinize how, how these very, very large multinationals operate. We've got to see how, how are they uh, exporting profits, uh, how are they manipulating national environments. Does that absolutely. mean, while we're on the mining sector, that it was perhaps a mistake to have allowed uh, Anglo and Billiton and those, these very big mining companies to leave so easily? And now most of their operations are really no longer in South Africa. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the gold mining story is different to the platinum story, so uh, I, I wouldn't say. But I would, what I would say is that I think other sectors are very different. Yes. So you, for example, the clothing sector. So we've yes. done a lot of work on the clothing sector. Yes. South Africa used to have a thriving clothing manufacturing market. Right. Uh, when I first came to live in South Africa and work in South Africa in the early 1990s, so you, South Africa was still exporting uh, clothing uh, garments to global markets. I remember being in New York in, in the late 1990s and buying a jacket in, in Macy's or whatever and, and opening it up and it, and it said made in South Africa and this was a, a good wool jacket. And a lot of those would have been made here in Cape Town. They, a lot of those would have been made here in Cape Town. Right? But we know that in the, it's really since 2000 the clothing industry in South Africa has, has taken a dive. Now, it's taken a dive for two reasons. The one reason is indeed uh, uh, the fact that South African markets have been deeply penetrated, by chi especially by Chinese producers. That's partly because of tariff reduction. Right. But, of course, what we forget is that in 2000, there was no Chinese production. Right? Even if there had been no tariff, produc tariff reduction, those Chinese firms would have still come in because they didn't really exist. But it wouldn't way. have been as bad. It wouldn't have been as bad. But... South Africa has also lost all of its export markets, pretty much. You, if you go to shops, if you go to Macy's today, you will never find a South African-made jacket. Now, you can't blame that on tariff reduction, because tariffs, what they do is they protect domestic markets right. for domestic producers. Right? They don't protect foreign markets, export okay. markets. Okay. So we've lost export markets and domestic markets. So the story must go far beyond tariffs. Oh. And the oh. other part of the story, half the story is tariffs and so on, other half of the story is, is wages. And what we can see in the clothing industry is that uh, there has been job destruction. And we argue that some of the job destruction is because uh, the, the, the major employers and the trade union have uh, conspired together to, to, to raise wages at a level which undermines uh, uh, competitiveness in some, se some parts, in some uh, parts of the country. Well, you, you also take on this other very delicate area, which is uh, the minimum wage and, and the trade unions. Of course, our trade unions were built out of idealism mm. in the 70s as a bulwark mm. against the apartheid state and the mm. mon mon monopolistic uh, businesses. Um, but, and, but now, uh, some argue that they're the labor aristocracy, and of course, their interest is not so strong, not in the poor because their interest is in, in protecting their members. That's exactly right. So in the book, the last part of the book looks at the politics of this. Uh, you know, we have poverty, we have, poverty, we have policies that s partly mitigate but partly uh, cause poverty. Why, why is this? Why, why isn't the politics more pro-poor? So in the last part of the book we look at that uh, and we, we're, we're, we're quite critical of big business but we're also very critical of, of the trade unions. And would that include the minimum wage? Well, on the minimum wage, which we don't uh, uh, engage with that much in this book, because the debate is, is very recent, but on the national minimum wage, on the minimum wage issue, you know, we, we are, uh, we're in favour of minimum wages. Right? But oh. you, you have to be very careful about the level at which minimum wages are set. You need to set minimum wages at a level that takes into account possible uh, job destruction effects. Um, so, uh, in a sector like clothing, you, you don't want to set wages at a level which is going to result in firms shutting down and uh, Mr. Price having 100% Chinese imports rather than 80% Chinese imports. 
We're going to take this a little further, but after the break. And we're back with Professor Jeremy Seekins. Um, Jeremy, we were talking about the unions. Uh, um, and of course, the other side of it, which you make, uh, the point you make in your book, is that you support a basic income grant because you argue that the one part of our society, particularly that is left out of the, all these welfare programs, is, is young people who don't have jobs. You give to the old, we give to the young, uh, we give to mothers, but we don't give to young people. Uh, so a basic income grant would in some ways ameliorate what you're saying about being careful with minimum wages and with uh, uh, going at the trade unions. That's right. I mean, I think as a society, we have to ask, what do we do for the poor? Yep. Now, if as a society we've, uh, we follow policies or the government pursues policies that results in large-scale unemployment and poverty, we have to say, well, w w what is plan B? Yes. And in that, if you choose that kind of economic growth path, the, I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility of society uh, to implement plan B through the welfare system. Yes. And a basic income grant would be a way of doing that. It's a basic income grant which would pay every citizen uh, uh, a, a, a modest income every month just to really keep you out of, of, of extreme depths of poverty. This is a, you know, it's, it's a very radical uh, position. Um, it's certainly affordable in macro terms, uh, but there's not a lot of political support for it. You know, the Democratic Alliance backed it um, some years ago. I don't know if they still do, but it was their policy in one of the elections. Yes, but they're, they're not in the government. And if no. they were in the government, it would be interesting to see what they'd do. Well, they might. really do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, basic, the, you know, the basic income grant movement globally is a movement which is mainly driven by, by, by the progressive forces, if you like, the left, but actually has some support on the political right as well uh, because you don't have disincentive effects on, on, on work. But, you know, I mean, in your book, you talk about the, the, uh, these words like neoliberalism and social democracy, which we'll come back to in a minute. But given the way the world is changing, the Trump effect in the US, the uh, Brexit and the changes in Europe and in South Africa as well, left and right are in somewhat of a limbo. It's not clear what is left and right anymore. I, I think that's exactly right. And it's especially true in, in, a, in, in, in the context like South Africa, where many of the, the policies which are associated with social democracy historically, uh, because they're pro-poor, aren't necessarily pro-poor in, in, in a context like South Africa. I want to come back to social democracy in a moment, but first I wanted to uh, ask you this. The, something that struck me when I was in government too, that the education system mm -hmm. did not seem to be geared to our economic needs. And so we have this vast unemployment, but we have pockets, quite big pockets, of where, where there's skills shortages. I know in IT, which is an area I was interested. But the, uh, 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 the democratic government abolished the apprenticeship system, some of the tech training colleges, the teachers' colleges. Uh, can you make sense of that? And is the government uh, connecting the educa its education policy to produce the kind of graduates that we actually need in the, in the economy? Well, I think the, the evidence is overwhelming, and the, the education system is appalling. Uh, it's really been a, a disaster, uh, not just for 20 years, but for much longer. Cool. So the you know, schooling system is not producing the graduates that we need, and that does result in skill shortages, in, in, in critical skill shortages. But, but that's, that's part of the story. If we reform the school system, if we got the school system exactly right, would that solve the problem? No, it wouldn't. Because what we have is really a mismatch between the supply of labor and the demand for labor. Exactly. You can improve the, the, the quality of labor, if you like, through a better school system. But if there aren't jobs, uh, you know, a, more, a more educated population doesn't automatically generate and create more jobs. But surely there has to be a, a link between the education. Yeah. For instance, do we need more plumbers? Do, a lot of people make a lot more money in plumbing than, yeah. than you and I do writing. <laughs> uh, um, do we need more uh, apprentices? Uh, and then gear the education system, provide those things, as well as the university graduates. Look, I think what we need is, we need two things. We need uh, a better education system, uh, better uh, technical uh, training s systems. We need to produce more skilled 
a, a, a more skilled population, uh, remove those skill constraints on economic growth. That's really important, um, absolutely important. But we also need to make sure that we are generating the kinds of jobs which people with few scarce skills can take. Because we, we, for the next generation, or two generations, or three generations, we're always going to have large numbers of, of, of low-skilled people in this country. And we can't just throw them on a scrap heap. Either we have to create jobs uh, for them, uh, we need to protect the unskilled jobs that are out there, we need to create more jobs for less skilled workers, or we need to have a welfare system that actually provides minimally for people even if they don't have work. Presumably both in tandem. Both in tandem would be best. Best of all would be job creation, but if you can't get job creation, go the welfare route. Because it's not going to be overnight. Um, finally, I wanted to come back to this question of social democracy, because as you point out in, in, your, uh, in your book, social democracy is, has been a respected word in Europe for, uh, ter a term uh, in Europe for many years, uh, and it sort of explains, uh, provides a way to say that we accept the market uh, is, the pro is the driver of economic growth, but the state must be strong enough to, to manage a, a market and also to, uh, to provide uh, sa so safety nets and to ensure that, that everybody is, is, is protected. Um, but in South Africa, it's sort of an unpopular term. Why is that? Well, it's an ironic situation. South Africa has many social democratic policies, we have a classic social democratic alliance in government, a, a multi-class party in close alliance with the labor movement. It sounds classically social dem democratic. Yes. We have the kinds of social democratic policies you'd expect, right? but we don't get pro-poor outcomes, and nobody says, I'm a social democrat. Uh, why does nobody say they're a social democrat? I, mean, I think it's, it, this reflects really South African history, which is that the, one of the legacies of apartheid is that our politics is still bearing... Uh, the, obviously the, the imprint of what we could call nationalism or anti-colonial struggle, that there's a strong impetus towards a, essentially a, a uh, anti-colonial class coalition of, of... And also because, frankly, when the ANC were getting going, when Mandela and Sisulu mm -hmm. were looking for support from the West, they didn't get it. Uh, in fact, the opposite. And so they went to the East, and that also um, raised the profile of Marxism right. and communism. Exactly. So we have a very powerful communist uh, party, right. very powerful within the ANC. We don't have a, we've never had a faction within the ANC that's prepared to stand up and say, we're social democrats. We stand for social democracy. So we have the policies, but we don't have the champions. Although you seem to be saying that South Africa under the ANC has elements of social democracy, but also elements of neoliberalism. Well, social democracy, of course, is a, is a, as a package, as you said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, if you like, it's an approach which accepts that the market will, will operate in important respects. Right. So in Sweden, classically the Scandinavian social democracies, the state allowed private sector to, to prosper. But, as you said, the state comes in and says, well, we're going to regulate the labour market, we're going to have a welfare system, we're going to have public health, public education, in order to ensure that the benefits of growth are redistributed equitably in society. We have to end on that note. Uh, hopefully it's a positive one. The book is Poverty, Politics and Policy in South Africa. Why has poverty persisted after apartheid? It's by Jeremy Seekings and Nicolina Trass, who couldn't be here. Uh, thanks for watching. Good night and happy reading.